great relationships. And you take care of those because when things slow down or stop, whatever part of your journey you're in, those relationships will sustain you. What I would like to say to inspire any others is that if we can get to a level of success and experience the things that we've gotten to experience, truly anybody can. That was Linda Davis and Lang Scott. Linda and Lang are a power couple and influencers in the Nashville music community with numerous accolades for their music in both country and the Christian music industry, including multiple Grammy Awards. They are also parents of two talented daughters, Riley Jean Scott and Lady A's frontwoman, Hillary Scott. More than three decades ago, Lang and Linda arrived in Music City. They met, married, and built their lives around entertainment. Today, Linda's perhaps best known for her mega-hit duet, Does He Love You, with Reba McIntyre. In addition, she amassed her own hits and awards throughout her 30-plus years of entertaining audiences and touring around the world with artists including Reba and Kenny Rogers. Lang is no stranger to the limelight. He was the winning vocalist in the first season of the You Can Be a Star talent competition on the Nashville Network, a recording artist with MCA Records, and a guitarist and backup vocalist for Reba. In this Squeeze the Day, learn how their determination and perseverance are leaving a legacy through music. I'm Sally Hussey, the CEO of 50 Forward, and we're glad you joined us to hear inspiring stories from older adults. Their words of wisdom are well worth sharing as we seek to navigate a meaningful and purpose-driven second chapter in our life. This podcast is made possible through the work of 50 Forward and our mission to support, champion, and enhance the lives of those 50 and older. Today's Squeeze the Day is brought to you by the All of Us Research Program from the National Institutes of Health. Learn how you can help change the future of health by participating in the program. Visit www.joinallofus.org to learn more. I'm Susan Sizemore, Communications Director of 50 Forward, so let's get started. Welcome, Lang and Linda. Hi, Susan. Hey, Susan. Great to be on air with you. We go way back. I mean, I don't think there's a long enough time frame for us to get all caught up, but (laughs) we're looking forward to this. Well, thank you. Thanks for making time in in your busy schedule, and also thanks for sharing your story with us. I just want to talk to you about your life and a lot of things that people might not know about you, and then some things they might, but the two of you have had some interesting and formative years in Nashville. Let's talk a bit about following your dream and moving to Music City. So my story, I was born in East Texas. And when I was 19, I moved to Nashville to, you know, be on the Grand Ole Opry is what my goal was. I didn't really think anything more than that. That was what I wanted to do. And, you know, just how things fell when I was a a 19 year old, made a friend that said, well, come on. And he was no more than really an acquaintance, but I was so raring to go, uh, that was all it took. So I moved to Nashville and basically had to start over. The things that I had done back in Texas did not really make a whole lot of difference in Nashville other than the passion. And then shortly after I moved to Nashville, I met Lang. And there was an instant chemistry there. And then a, a few months later, we became an exclusive couple, you know, and two years later we married. That's how it all started. But there were a lot of starts and stops regarding industry and professional things for me. It looked like it was going to happen, and then it kind of fell through. A record deal, then it fell through, kind of a thing. It didn't deter me, though. I still set my goals, and I was going to reach them. And I had an amazing partner to reach them with me. And then we reach goals on our own together separately, you know, the, all the combination. Lang, what about you? What's your story? Well, I hail from South Carolina and I, I moved here in 1982, in January of 1982, about six months before Linda got here. And I grew up really small town, about 500 people called Harleyville, South Carolina. It's just west of Charleston, about 35 miles. And about age of seven years old, I started playing guitar. I had an uncle that played guitar and I loved loved hearing him play. And so it inspired me to start playing guitar at seven. 
I took some lessons and then um, later on, around 16 years of age, I, I became serious and got with a really, really great guitar teacher for about six months and absorbed most of everything that he knew and started singing seriously about that time as well with it. So I was the wedding singer and the funeral singer and the church singer and the beauty pageant singer, entertained <laughs> all those things. So went to college and, and I changed majors a couple of times, just really was not into college at all. And, and I entered a statewide contest in Columbia, South Carolina, and ended up winning the contest. And three of the judges that were there, one was the producer of the group Alabama. His name was Harold Shedd. Uh, Harold's a great guy, still here in Nashville, still living. And then two other judges were a couple that kind of took me up under his wing. He was a songwriter who was from South Carolina, but had moved to Nashville. And so he did my first recording session. We came up in December of that year, in December of 81, and I fell in love with the city. And I went back and I packed up my Ford Courier truck. I dropped out of my third year of college and took my $235 in my checking account <laughs> and my PV sound system and moved to Nashville. And within two weeks, I landed a job downtown at the Sheridan, played their happy hour, which was originally supposed to be about for six weeks as they were remodeling and it turned into about a two year job down there. So it paid the bills and kept me in town and allowed Linda and me to go out on a date every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> so what advice would you give to others wishing to do the same? Because, you know, people are moving to Music City all the time to Nashville trying to hit it big. You just have to be so determined and persevere, you know, because if you've got a measure of talent, which that's hopefully they do if they want to come here and try this, you just have to persevere until what is it that Oprah says uh, success is when preparation meets opportunity? I suggest they come when they're young without anybody else to be responsible for. If you can come before you're married, come before you have kids, I believe your chances of staying and toughing it out and waiting for that opportunity is going to be a little bit easier because I can't imagine feeling like, oh my goodness, I have this dream. Mama has this dream. That ended up happening anyway as our careers unfolded. We did have a child, Hillary. I had a husband. And that does give a greater sense of, oh man, they're so patient with me. I, I feel kind of selfish right now, but you have less conflict in your heart if you come before you have those responsibilities. Mm -hmm. What about you, Lang? Do you agree? I do. And it's just like you become quickly conflicted, as as Linda said, when you're pairing, OK, I'm, I'm trying to really become a successful whatever, insert whatever vocation you want in there. But as far as an entertainer goes, you give up a lot of family time, you know, to go and pursue that because you want somebody in Linda's case, she was signed to, you know, three different major labels you know, through her career. And it requires a lot of time, you know, radio tours and, and, you know, the touring aspect after the fact is something that's a little more controllable, but at first you're just completely at their mercy because you want to break, you know, that was really the, the most trying time of our marriage. And we had already been married for a few years. Seven. Yeah. And she went on these extensive radio tours and I had Hillary at the house, you know, by myself working out there at the Nashville network during those years. So I would get Hillary up in the mornings, drop her off at childcare, go to work a full day. Production days were even harder, pick her up in the afternoon. Linda's gone Monday through Friday. So that can put a lot of strain and stress on a marriage if you haven't based it on real solid ground. But Susan, we have a friend who has worked for years, and he's a successful accountant. And I bet our friend stayed gone more hours from his wife and kids than we did in his profession versus the music business. So I think any professional who wants to go on up in the chain of their profession, there is a lot of sacrifices. And mm -hmm. It's nice when you have a partner, I mentioned that a second ago, that is in it with you, and together you make it work. The single mamas out there, single parents, my hat is off to them because in anything that they're trying to succeed and just hang on and make it work, it it's hard. That's a really good point. 
I want to go back to something Lang touched on. Um, I didn't know that you had come to Nashville or had been very successful in a talent competition before you got to Nashville. But let's just talk about the talent shows and competitions right now because American Idol, The Voice, and other shows are all the rage these days. But you were the first national champion, Lang, on the Nashville networks. You can be a star. And I've heard you sing. You're very talented. But I want to know how that win changed your lives. That was August of 1983, and it resulted in, you know, some dreams that I had back in South Carolina. I got an appearance on the Grand Ole Opry. Part of the deal was a single release or a two single release for MCA Records. So I was on MCA Records for a while and had a chart single that got out. A video. And a video, and and um, it played on HBO. This was when videos were just starting out. And so this was a pretty low-budget video with Alan Reed directing, as you might imagine. <laughs> the best thing that came out of it, here's how it changed my life for the good, was that relationship with Alan and Mady. Because after I won, and I was all over still playing regionally, going out of town to keep my bills paid here in between the little Sheridan job that I had. And so Alan, after I won, he wanted a success story. And he says, well, you you need to look for songs. He says, I, I, he says, I'll give you a job. And so he hired me as a production assistant after I won the contest. Hmm. That just gave us some stabilization. A foundation. This was before Linda and I got married. So we married the year after that, but it just stabilized my presence in Nashville. And I can add some priceless things, and they have names. Billy Paul Jones. Alan and Mady, Susan Sizemore, and so many other friends that came yeah. from and, and relationships that came from those years. And that's the part that if, if you were going to ask me regarding what to tell up and comers, my answer would be, yes, you got to do all the things. You got to stay up to speed with your, your vocals and your musicianship and your songwriting skills and all that. But you make relationships and you take care of those because when things slow down or stop, whatever part of your journey you're in, those relationships will sustain you where a plaque on a wall or a little award on a shelf, that's pretty cold. But when you can call a friend that you made through the years and they just talk you off the ledge, <laughs> hang mm. on, you're going to be fine. You, you're you supposed to be here. Whatever their pep talk is, that's what you get from establishing relationships. And, and Alan Reed, giving you that opportunity, Lang, gave us as a couple, you as an individual, as a family, I cannot tell you the wonderful stories and conversations and heartfelt love that abounds because of that. Really, really nice. You know, I think, too, when you speak of relationships, I want to talk a little bit, Linda, about your relationship and specifically your duet with Reba McIntyre. That was not only legendary, but probably some sort of a turning point in your career as well. I want you to just talk a little bit about the experience. Well, you know, I got to back up before that to where even that could even happen. And that was because through those early years, I used to work at another Sheraton. We kind of had the Sheraton's <laughs> corner, didn't we, Lang? Notice that. <laughs> uh, the Sheraton Music City, which was out close and still is out close to Opryland. And a beautiful hotel. I was one of the first people, along with a couple of other women, that they hired to keep that little piano bar going. And... There, I met several people that were in the music business. One, Walter Miller, you remember Walter, he was the uh, producer of the CMA Awards. And they would stay there at our little hotel when they were in town producing the show and they would rehearse. And so there were several weeks that they hold up at the Sheraton. And after work, they'd come over and have a drink down there where I was. So nice, so complimentary. And I had the courage one night to go up and it wasn't because of anything I drank that I got courage. I just got up the courage. And I said, Walter, I've been noticing on those award shows that, you know, I watch every year and I see y'all every year coming in and out. And I said, you always hire somebody to come and give those awards when people walk up on stage. There's a girl in a long dress that hands them out. I said, I came from Texas and I brought a few long dresses with me. 
that still looked pretty good. <laughs> if you need somebody to do that, because I just wanted to go there, Susan. I just want to be there. I would be happy to be that award girl. And he would mustered up the kindest words that he could. And, and he said, Linda, no, we're not going to do that because one day you're going to get up there and receive your own. And we'll just wait on that. But that's going to happen. So he prophesied that that would happen. And I got to leave the Share to Music City job because my career did take off. And that little duet you spoke of got me up there on the stage to receive an award, just like Walter said. And seeing him, okay, back to a relationship, he was one of the first ones to come up to me after I got that award and look at me and say, I told you, I told you. And another person, I've told this story before, but Cheryl Riddle, who cut my hair and Lang's hair and Hillary's first haircut, she took care of Bill. She took care of Vince. She took care of so many artists. She was in the wings that night that I walked out to sing that song with Reba on the CMAs. And seeing her gave me such my nerves. It just calmed me down because there's my friend. She loves me. She doesn't, you know, she only wants good for me. And when I walked out to sing that song, I was better because she was standing there right before I took my first step out on that stage. And after meeting Reba before we did our duet, I feel like there was already a little bit of an established camaraderie. I was always a fan of hers, and she learned of me because I would be singing demos through the week. I would go downtown before I went to work at night. I'd go downtown and do demos in the studio. So a lot of people would send their songs to her because I had kind of sound like her, they thought, and she might could hear herself singing a song that I sang. And that's how she became familiar with me. And then Lang and I were brought in as background vocals and Lang played guitar and we toured with her for many years. It turned out pretty good. Tell us a little bit, for those listening, we didn't really say the name of the song. Talk a little bit about the song and what that song meant. <laughs> okay, the song's called Does He Love You, and I guess we're closing in on 30 years ago. It was one of those three-way ties over this rotten man. These two women just, you know, one's got to have him, and well, one's married to him, and I was the other woman. There was a pretty cool epic video that was shot, and I did get blown up, which is appropriate. That's what I get. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it was just one of those animated, and of course, back then, we had the big 90s hair going on, so you throw big hair in the picture, and it's going to look like a cat fight. And we did everything but pull each other's hairs out. Everybody knew that it was going to be huge, and, and it was. And, it, you know, to get back to your original question to Linda, it just like put things on afterburners for Reba's touring, which we were a part of. So that song was huge at the concerts. I mean, I, I remember and I'm, I'm not over exaggerating this. I mean, there were like 10 minute ovations for that song Wow! to where we would have to do a reprisal of the chorus. You know, as far as outside things for Linda, it opened up a lot of doors because of that exposure as well that she otherwise would not have had those opportunities to go and do. You know, I want to go back to something that you mentioned to Lang about being the father figure sometimes when Linda was traveling, but also the fact that you both did travel, you know, a lot together and begs the question kind of with Hillary and Riley, your second daughter, did you homeschool them or did they travel with you? We homeschooled Hillary for a few years that she mm. traveled with us. This was before we were actually on the road with Reba. When we joined Reba's band, my dad had just changed jobs and my mom, they were in a position to where and we could afford it. So we basically just hired them as a full time nanny and we moved them to Nashville just in the same neighborhood where we were at the time. And so our my mother was our full-time nanny for Hillary. And so through those, gosh, we're only talking from 93 to what, about 2000. So it was really about six or seven years. So it was crazy. It was a crazy time that we were, we were probably gone 
60, 65 percent of the time during several of those years. And and Hillary, if she if you interviewed her, she's not 50 yet, but if you interviewed her, she would probably tell you that it, as much as my mom and dad gave a great environment for her to grow up during that, that was her hardest time. And, and I think she did hold some resentment toward the industry, not us, thankfully, but towards the industry for taking mom and dad away, you know, as much as they did. And she never showed any interest because of that until she was 16. Not that she didn't sing because she did. She went to school and she was in a praise band at her school. And Hillary always had a great voice, could hold her part. We would sing as a family around the house and Christmas and all kinds of fun things, church. But she never showed an interest to do it in a, as a career until she was 16. We were all in a uh, Linda Davis family Christmas show out at Opryland, Gaylord Opryland, for three years consecutively. By now, she's 16. Riley was two. So Riley Jean was two, three, and four. 16, 17, 18 were the age uh, of Hillary. And when she began doing that, I believe what she saw was the camaraderie that we had as a band, the crew. Miss Rose would come out there, uh, my mother-in-law, and keep Riley Jean. She'd change her clothes and help her get out on stage at the right time. And, you know, it was just a family. And that's what Lang and I knew all along. Uh, The camaraderie, the support, and the fun. It's just fun. These are the kind of things. Is there sacrifice? Yes. Absolutely. I love the line in uh, League of Their Own when Tom Hanks tells Gina Davis at the end, she says, well, it just got too hard. And Tom mm-hmm. Hanks looks back at her and he says, the hard is what makes it great, you know, <laughs> and and that's kind of the thing. You know, you sacrifice, but you surround yourself with, with sound people uh, in your circle, in your inner circle who kind of absorb some of that the hardness of some of the sacrifice that you have to do. And um, my goodness, I don't want anybody listening to this and listening to us when I say sacrifice and the perseverance and the determination that it takes, because out of families, we have been so blessed Mm -hmm. and the things that we've gotten to do from where Linda is from, which is not even a town, it's a community where she grew up. And from the small town that I came from, what I would like to say to inspire any others is that if we can get to a level of success and and experience the things that we've gotten to experience any truly anybody can if they have the perseverance and the level of talent to pursue it because people overall in this world i believe are still good and when you encounter somebody they recognize that talent they're going to run across people that will help them that they will look back and, and and realize that that was a critical crossroads when I met that person and they introduced me to so-and-so mm-hmm. who introduced me to so-and-so. And without that encounter, I would never be here. There was a banker, Buster Bear was his name. And he was just so kind and he knew I liked to sing. And there was a drug store in Carthage, Texas, off the square, that actually had a little rack. I bet, I mean, it wasn't, I don't even know how many publications, but for some reason they had some song books. And he said, Linda, you go down there and you tell them to put on whatever book you pick out, put it on my tab, put it on my, you know, that's when you could do that. Hmm. He bought me a John Denver song book that I wore the pages off of that. But that man, Mr. Buster Aber. He believed that I was worth him paying for me a songbook. And that, you have no idea when you're doing something like that, what a fire that keeps lit in a young person. Mm-hmm. And it, it it probably wasn't a whole lot off of his budget, but I couldn't afford one. Daddy and Mama couldn't afford one for me, but and he knew that. So he bought it for me. And mm-hmm. I sung every song in that. I mean, I thought John Denver was going to, you know, eventually get to meet him. I, I didn't, but... That, that was just inspiring. And that I could name you a hundred or more people that did that for me. And mm. people that are, what, are listening to this interview, they may be that person to somebody else. You know, the whole concept of paying it forward comes forth, I think, in that statement. And I want to 
kind of circle back around to your background, and you, you've you mentioned Hillary a few times, and for those who don't know, Hillary Scott is the front woman for Lady Antebellum, and she's your daughter, and I just can't imagine what that is like for you all to watch her career rise, and then I'm curious how your background might have helped guide her through the highs and lows of entertainment. Well, she was born into music, and we're so thankful that God gifted her with a beautiful voice and a good ear to hear it. She's starting to play the piano now. I'm so proud mm-hmm. of her. She's playing that piano on her shows in front of a big, big audience. She's so brave. But God gave her the talent, but he gave her a heart, which we're most proud of. But they won the lottery. I mean, as talented as they are, they would tell you that they are just very lucky. They work hard, so they're sustaining. But just to have that platform and that opportunity is one in a million. So she learned how to mesh with people and to be able to blend in with a group because that's what being on the road is. You have, you cannot be hard to deal with and keep a job, <laughs> not in confined quarters like a bus. Little did she know when she was learning all that subconsciously that she would be blending in with two other people to make a trio because that's a lot of confined quarters with somebody that you're not married to, Mm. but they do that well. She was put into a very professional environment to sing at, at 16 years old. And so a person that came out to the show to see Linda and, you know, to see the show was Victoria Shaw. Mm -hmm. Victoria is a a tremendously gifted and and successful songwriter in town. She wrote The River for Garth and she wrote I Love the Way You Love Me for John Michael Montgomery. And she became fascinated with Hillary's voice and took her up under her wing and started exposing Hillary, setting up co-writing sessions, you know, and she really, under Victoria's tutelage, became a great songwriter. I say that because Linda and I would never have pushed Hillary. Matter of fact, I did as much as I could to push her away from the music business. Mm -hmm. You know, just go get a two year nursing degree, you know, just go something that you can fall back on. And and this was about the time that she had met Charles and, and Dave and she was at MTSU at the time, but she was leaving MTSU and going and getting with them and writing, you know, because they wrote about seven out of 10 songs on their first album. But I always, I come back to the Christmas show and I come back to Victoria Shaw because Victoria became Hillary's head cheerleader and Victoria has a tenaciousness about her and buddy, she does not mind busting down doors. And she did that for our daughter and she did that for Lady A. And so I I always like to give her credit because we could not be that in the business. Mm -hmm. We, mom and dad, momagers, you know, they're they're not welcome in, no. in that. And that's something else I'll share with anybody aspiring to be a singer. Mm. Don't allow your dad or your mom to try to manage you because that's just like that puts an X. Well, you know, they're usually our first managers because they drive us around. They pay for the lessons, whatever. But yeah. after you get to be, you know, of a certain age, it is good to have other people stepping up for you. I always wanted to remain daddy and give guidance based upon what's best for my child or best, you know, best for my children, as opposed to trying to manage something. You have to take it to an exploitive thing. And and so I always thank Victoria every time I see her because she did something that Linda nor I could really do for Hillary. And Hillary took it, you know, her drive and her work ethic and her determination got her this break. And as Linda said, they Hillary, again, if you would interview her, she would tell you that, yeah, we won the lottery. You know, we had a huge hit song and, and it just busted open doors for us. Let's just talk a little bit about Riley. Is she also interested in the music business? What's she up to these days? So Riley Jean has a great voice and her stage presence is I just think it's so great because she's funny, she's witty, she's got her daddy's quick wit, and I don't even know that she realizes how good she is up there, but it's not her passion, Susan. Mm. It's not, and it isn't because she has a bad taste in her mouth about it like maybe Hillary did when she was young. Her mom and daddy were gone. 
So she was two years out of high school before she realized what she wanted to do. She did realize she did not want to go to college right away. So she worked. And then she felt led to uh, go into like student counseling. Hmm. And she's going to college now. She's doing great, is happy, feels like she's right where she's supposed to be. However, you tell them what she did a few nights ago, which is crazy. Yeah, through the um, the belonging church downtown. And they have a great music, big choir and stuff. And so she was asked to be one of a 20-piece choir, and she got to sing at the Ryman oh. uh, just last Friday. And the cool thing about that is that Hillary was already scheduled. So Hillary was in the audience. She was a paid so, customer. <laughs> so she was a paid customer. She was in the audience with a friend because she wanted to go to that. And Riley's on stage uh, at the Ryman, and, and Hillary's in the audience. So it, it was pretty good turnabout. That's wonderful. Priceless. I thought you were going to say she became a nurse. (laughs) No, no, she's, I I don't think anybody would want Riley to be their nurse. Yeah, I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that. Well, you could probably say I'm thinking nursing, counseling, social work, all of those things are kind of outreach and could kind of be gifts all wrapped together. So let's, I'm eager to see where she ends up. You know what? And Linda said it earlier, both of our children are just so tenderhearted and they are, they just have empathy towards people that are that are struggling and they have such a desire to help and those are the important things you know as we go through life is to instill that into your children and that they take it and they just both of my girls have been in every era of their growth miles ahead of where I was at their age mm-hmm. I agree just from a maturity level from a an intelligence level, and um, we are just so appreciative of that and, and grateful because nobody's nobody. I don't care what kind of family you have. And, and there's no guarantees with that. Mm-hmm. You know, no one's immune to trouble when it comes into your family. And for whatever reason, we've been blessed that we've had nothing but joy and some hard headedness, you know, through those times from our children. But they were just easy to raise. I mean, they really were. And they've just been the joy of our lives. Mm. And they pick good friends. Oh, that's so big. Mm. And anybody listening that has children or grandchildren, who they pick for their friends and then their partners, you know, their life partners, that can totally change the direction. And now we have grandchildren. Yeah. Can we go there now? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go there. We're going to go there and then we'll come back to music a little bit because you talked a little bit about kind of that intergenerational sharing. And I'm wondering, are there things that you two are learning now from your daughters and granddaughters? Oh, gosh, always. You know what, Susan, when we made a record as a family several years ago, Ricky Skaggs produced it, and Hillary Scott and the Scott family, an inspirational record. When we were in the studio, which we've been in the studio now laying for 30 years plus. Well, closer to 40. Gosh, hello. And then we went in and Hillary had her ideas about it. She was driving that train, really. We were all equally throwing our two cents and and making adjustments here and there as somebody had a better idea than another. But she was driving that train and Lang and I just were in awe of her Mm -hmm. instincts and of her suggestions and she would make decisions and it was like okay there's I can't think of anything better Lane couldn't think of it yes we're gonna go with that and and it just was so beautiful to feel so safe and she had a few Grammys under her belt by then so it wasn't like we were with a a beginner but still to just be in the presence of our daughter in a professional way it was just beautiful to see and easy to say yes ma'am you you got yes we're gonna do it like you say because that's that's good it just feels right and she was and I think Riley Jean was able to observe that with her sister you know it was it was just good and and Riley's taught us things I mean she's got in the present day of what's going on in the world you know Lang and I I mean I'm I'm throwback. I'm happy to be a throwback in some areas. But our girls, they are living in the current, the social media stuff, and we learn a lot from them. But what we hope we can still teach them is, okay, all that's fine, 
but you got to keep your feet on the ground and Jesus has to be running the show for you or you're going to get lost in the weeds. So just keep priorities in place and I think you will be better for it. Most well said. You learn stuff from everybody. We've learned tons from my children and, and too many to mention. But when we all get still and quiet and you think about, okay, if we can be still and quiet in today's world, for me, I'm a fixer. I'm a type A control freak. And I have to go through cycles to where when I get to the point to where I feel out of control, uh, and especially when I had my company for 17 years, I had a digital media company after I left Reba's band that I ran for, owned and ran for 17 years. It was stressful. And so, Linda, we finally locked in that the most healthy thing for me was not to try to take a long vacation and do these little mini vacations to get, you know, just a long weekends, do those three or four times a year. And when you get still and quiet, it always came back to me that setting priorities. What are your priorities? Let's 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 get those back in order. And unfortunately, those priorities it has nothing to do with self. And so I, I always told people, I said, yeah, when I get quiet and still, and I think about all that stuff, what I tell people, I just try to keep my life effed up as much as I can. You know, faith, <laughs> family, friends, uh, finances, and fitness. And if you put those in the right order, and you keep those things in the right order, and keep your focus on those, then and and the hardest thing for men, I think, I'm going to speak for men because I still don't understand women. Um, <laughs> is this, and this did not occur for me until we had our first child, until Hillary was born. Whenever you get to the point that you realize that it's not about you, then that's when I think that a, a man crosses over to become a full-fledged adult, because it's not about us. It, it's not about us. It's about loving one, of, you know, loving your fellow man, loving your family, and I've never considered a, sac a sacrifice, you know, to provide for my family and to be there for them. So it's like when that gets out of line and I don't care what you want to go do, whether you want to be an entertainer or whether you're going to be a traveling salesman or whatever. If that gets out of sorts, then nothing else is going to fall into place. You're going to be living a very challenging life that way. So for me, and, and I hope that if anybody wants to glean anything from any wisdom that I have to say, get still, get quiet, realize and put your priorities in order and try to live your life by that way. Mm. And you saying that brings me to another question that I was going to ask, but you kind of went there already. So I'm going to ask Linda, you know, we talk a little bit about aging and it's a part of life, but poses challenges. And especially for those in high profile careers, Linda, I'm just thinking about your perspective on how you manage and stay relevant and find balance in life. Mm. Balance is always and has always been a goal. And you might have to ask somebody else if I managed it okay. But from my perspective, it was because there were other people helping. Like when Lang mentioned Miss Rose and Mr. W.M., his parents, had they not been involved in helping take care of Hillary, in those early years of our career, we couldn't have done it. They made it possible. When we were home, we tried our best to be present and to plan things and to, to make sure we spent time with our children. Now, Riley, see what's so funny about our lives is there's 14 years between our daughters. Mm -hmm. So you might would call that two only children. A lot of people have big gaps between their kids because maybe it's two different marriages. That's not the case here. Uh, Lang always says it's God's sense of humor showing up, you know, <laughs> giving us two only <laughs> children. But it gave, it's like each child has a different perspective of being raised in our home and where our careers were. Mm -hmm. So Hillary lived through the Reba days of the 90s. Riley Jean lived through the days with her daddy owning this company that he shared with you. And I was touring more with Kenny Rogers and doing less gone than we were during the 90s. So she had more of both of us around. So my mother-in-law and father-in-law didn't have quite the same weight of raise, helping us raise Riley mm -hmm. as they did with Hillary. 
although they were around and very much a part of it. So, you know, the balance that we struck raising one child and then the second child looked a little different, but that was always a priority to try to be aware and not just oblivious to the needs of the ones that were left at home Mm -hmm. when I was gone. But feeling like I was managing the priorities and being able to live with myself of, was it spread out? Was I spread out enough to the right people that needed me and still making some momentum career-wise? I hope I got it right. And I now that we're, you know, empty nesters, of course, and doing our own musical endeavors, we ha- have to answer to each other and we're together most of the time. So I think we're pretty relevant and still having a big time. We're, we're blessed. I mean, we're talking now at over three decades of this, mm. closer to four. Susan, I, I learned something very valuable and kind of the impetus for the record that Linda referred to earlier that we did as a family was my dad contracted leukemia and mm. went through a six month battle with leukemia. We lost him in, on 11, 11, 11 in oh. 2011. And one of the, one of the biggest lessons I learned, and I feel so privileged to have been there in the hospital room with him a lot through that time. And I watched him just like from, you know, the anxiousness and the and the fear of having that diagnosis to get to a point of just complete peace, you know, through that. And everything that we talk about became epitomized from him because I realized through that, hearing him talk about people that he grew up with all of his life, you know, critical crossroads, the people that, you know, made a difference in his life. Here's Here's what I'd like to say. I realized that a person's happiness is directly connected to the health of their relationships. And that's with your spiritual relationships. That's with your spouse. That's with your friends. That's with people you encounter. And if your relationships are intact and there's not turmoil in your relationships, that I believe is, is where happiness can be found. So, We still go out. We still perform in performing arts centers, anywhere from 250 to 600 seat auditoriums. We sing in churches. We we go out. We still love what we do. We're in a position to where we don't have to do that full time. And we're grateful for that. But what we enjoy out of that is, again, about relationships. We get to connect with people in smaller audiences now. And we try to through our music and our stories, which, as you can tell, we're, you know, got tons of stories that we can pull from that are true, that we can really connect with those people and hopefully impart some some human kindness and and joy and hope. And that's what we try to do at this stage of our lives. That's that's our goal. And that's our mission. Mm, That's beautiful. There are a couple of more things I want to ask you. But one thing just before it gets away from me is, um, Linda, you referenced Kenny Rogers and kind of how performing with him was a different time in your life. But just a, a snapshot for people wanting to know about Kenny Rogers and performing with him and, and uh, you know, just kind of those days. Wow. Well, I had uh, met Kenny in the 90s. So there was over 20 to 25 years of a relationship with Kenny Rogers. But his last dozen or 15 years, and Kenny did a Christmas show that was, he was known for that for, I don't know, probably 30 or 40 years. And a lot of artists that you would talk to did the Kenny Rogers Christmas show, was a guest at some point or another, or opened for him. He was so revered, not only by the fans all over the world, but the artists. He was so good and generous to us artists. But having known him over 20 years and open shows and been a part of his show, the last dozen years I was with him. And of course, then the last few years, what as his health was failing, it was just one of those opportunities that I would have never known to pray for. And would I have ever known that I would become friends with Kenny Rogers when I would sit down in East Texas and buy every United Artist 45 that he ever produced and the TV shows that he, you know, him and Dolly's Christmas. I mean, all of that. It was just unimaginable 
that I would be a part of his circle. Uh, But what I learned from him was, man, if I could have written it all down as it was going down, I could have a book of some of his sayings Mm -hmm. and some of his stories. And But he just took care of people, the people around him. He took care of them. And that's family as well as music family. He wanted you to succeed because if it made him look good if you did good. So it wasn't like he was selfish with any of his toys, the smoke, the lights, the stage, anywhere you want to go, anything you want to use, you're welcome to. Because he was confident when he stepped out, he was going to have everything he needed, but he wanted you to have what he had if it would help you. And I think that's something that anybody listening, whether you're in the music business or not, that if you are generous with your things, with your resources, with your wisdom, it doesn't hurt you to share that. You know, some people will take advantage. Well, then that you might not get it anymore if you do that. But to start with, let's just share and see what you can do with this. If it'll help you, good. And he was one of the most kind and uh, giving people to be so famous and so iconic. It was a beautiful thing to to just watch. And regarding his stage presence and charisma, there's nobody that can touch him. He would I would stand in the wings and just watch him. He he put that audience right in the palm of his hand every night. And it was something to see and Mm -hmm. to be a part of and to be included in a show that just was timeless. And I will always treasure that. His legacy certainly is carrying on. I want to touch just a minute on something that our agency does. And more than anything, it's because I kind of want your take on this, but also want the listeners to know that. So 50 Forward is just a, we're a small nonprofit in Nashville, and we've just been reviewing our core values. And one of our core values is kindness. And to ensure in every interaction, regardless of the complexity or difficulty, is met with kindness and empathy by our team to give hope to those who think they're alone in this world. And of course, During COVID, we all felt alone. We all felt isolated. We all experienced perhaps a bit of disenfranchisement, maybe depression as a result. And I know at one point I just happened upon a concert, a porch concert that you all were doing at your house. And I want you to talk a little bit about what that did for you and for others and just briefly how that came about. Well, the eight of us hunkered down together, and that's Hillary and her husband, Chris, our son-in-law, who is amazing, wonderful man. The three kids, so that's five, Lang, myself, and Riley Jean, so the eight of us. We were in Florida where Hillary and Chris had a home, and I feel like Hillary and Chris did a beautiful job of isolating the children from ever knowing that there was something a little scary going on in the world and Mm -hmm. a lot of unanswered questions and unknowns. That was the goal, was to keep them from feeling any different other than, oh, Rara, who is, you know, their aunt, and Lolly and G-Paul are just hanging out with us at the beach house for a little while. Their measurement of time was like a child. that Days ran together. And my goodness, it was an awful time for a lot of people in the country and in the world, that sickness We had a beautiful family time because we thankfully were healthy. It was time that I can't even begin to to put a price on. But obviously, like Lang and Linda, if there's going to be very much time, there's going to be a song. There's going to be some music, good times, bad times, happy and sad. So I took the piano. Lang had a guitar, I'm sure, Chris had one down there, if I'm not mistaken. But, I mean, we just kind of knew when we left Nashville, this might be a minute. I don't know how long this is going to be, so let's take our our basic things that we need to survive besides each other. And our guitar and our piano was part of the, the toolkit, right? <laughs> well, people during that time, they just needed, and I mean, this is why we did it. I mean, we did it for ourselves, but we also did it because any sense of normalcy that you could impart on somebody to just say, hey, life is still vibrant here. Yeah, there's some uncertainty to this, but we refuse to operate and proceed through that with any sense of fear. And we just wanted to share a family unit 
and put that out there. We've never done a lot of live streams, and but we did that just to bring a sense of uh, music, happiness, joy, hope, mm-hmm. and let that spread out over the interweb. It was also so much fun to see all the comments and the interaction with people who are obviously thirsty for connection. Mm-hmm. And, yes. and I just, mm-hmm. it, it just warmed my heart on so many levels. So I had to ask. And people still are. I mean, everybody that I meet, we share commonalities of things that we can cling on to each other for those things. We may differ politically, we may differ religious, you know, opinions, but we're all part of a human race. And so the divisiveness that happens right now, number one, we need to take our the focus off of ourselves and think of others, lift up others, give them a hand up when they need a hand up and, and encourage them. And, and hopefully anything that we can do, if they see a light in us or, or something that we say or that we do can inspire them, then that's what it's all about. We do live in the same space, and we all need to make an effort to consider each other in this space, just like at the house. We, we can't always have it our way. We, we got to make sure somebody gets in a turn besides us, and that's the part of be, you, being a servant's heart, forgiveness. If somebody does hurt your feelings or, or say something, it's like, okay, be willing to to forgive or ask forgiveness. I mean, it's all just kind of simple, but yet it's maybe seems more difficult than it needs to be. And we don't get that right over time, every day. Not even in our own families do we get it right. But if we're mindful, if we try to be mindful of others and don't have to be right, that's how I think we muddle along and People have grace with us, and we should have grace with them. And you just got to take time to be patient with each other, and then you hope they're patient with you and get the most out of life and each other. So we have a couple of questions that we just ask everyone kind of in closing. And one is, is there a piece of advice that a parent or an older adult might have shared with you at the time that you thought, man, that is really silly? But now that rings true in your everyday life. So my daddy, there's a little story. So I'm the baby of three kids. And and of course, being raised in East Texas, we went to a little missionary Baptist church. My daddy smoked cigarettes. And I didn't like to smell it. And I I knew, even as a young kid, that can't be good for you. We'd go to church, and the preacher would talk about you know, what you need to not sin and don't smoke and don't drink and don't, you know. So I remember telling my daddy, I said, Daddy, that preacher said that it's that when you smoke, that's a sin. And he said, Linda Kay, you can make a sin out of anything. It didn't dawn on me what all that meant back then, but it was like, okay, we can overdo, we can pick apart and we can find fault. And that's, that's a sin. We, I mean, you have to keep things in balance. You used that word a little while ago. Mm-hmm. You got to, you know, just measure all of these things against what's in our heart and what the Lord put into motion for us to have a good life on earth, ultimately get into heaven with Him. But life on earth is meant to be joyful. It's meant to be in harmony, but it takes keeping things in perspective and in balance. And that's what I think my daddy meant. You can make a sin out of anything. And that stuck with me. So I'm going to quote Bill Gaither, who's a a great songwriter in the the Christian world, Southern gospel. But I I love this saying, and and don't take it the wrong way, but it's just a true, and it it will help everybody. (laughs) And he says, People change, but not much. That's just something we all should keep in our in our heads, you know. So one more question for both of you. What is it that you do to squeeze the day? Anytime my grandchildren are involved, that is squeezing the day and making me a happy camper. So that's a real easy one. My 
selfish self-indulgence is the first cup of strong coffee in the morning. So that always gets the day off and, and just being renewed, having that renewed feeling in the morning when you get up. But I, I will I will say this, and I don't just do a lot of the public displays of affection type of thing, but I'm truly married to my soulmate. And it's like she is um, the most consistent person that I know on a day to day basis, which is good because I'm all over the place. I'm I've got highs and lows, a little more of the volatility of, of how I stroll from day to day. And um, the squeeze the day that I have is just we we enjoy each other's company. We make each other laugh and we just love meeting people. We love sharing stories with them. And we're blessed right now. We know that we'll be going into some tribulations as we get older. But we're hey, we're going to face them together and yes. face them with with joy because we it's come out here. And, and I mean, we rely on our faith. We are confident in where we're headed. And so with that comes confidence freedom. that everything's yes there's a freedom there's a there's a freedom to love and as Linda said earlier my goodness just to practice grace and take a breath and and just realize we're in this world together it's a lot more fun it's it's what it's all about you know success is great i've seen success ruin a lot of people mm. it's what's at home what is that atmosphere what's mm-hmm. inside your heart yes you know bring out the goodness. Thank you so much for joining us today. Your story is inspiring and certainly reinforces for all of us that challenges can become opportunities. We can learn so much from one another and certainly from the experiences of those in their second chapter of life. Now we challenge everyone listening to go squeeze the day. Squeeze the day is made possible through listeners like you. If you enjoy this podcast, please help us continue to share inspiring stories of older adults and visit 54.org to make a contribution. That's F-I-F-T-Y-F-O-R-W-A-R-D dot O-R-G. Let's support, champion, and enhance the lives of older adults together. Together.